I don't work with the public sector, I work with corporations. When we talk about some of these issues, we'll find out they are very similar. So let's start first with the economy of, uh, of risk. What are companies facing? I'm talking about manufacturing companies, retail companies, companies that move stuff, not companies that write software. So you can think about all kind of random phenomena when there's a, you know, hurricanes and floods, you can think about accidents that uh, happen somewhere, not only to the company itself, but somewhere to one of the suppliers in its supply chain. You can think about government and politics. When we talk about the trade uh, war going on now, it affects every company that makes and sells stuff. Talk about non-compliance, when companies get caught uh, doing the wrong thing in terms of um, uh, corporate social responsibility, environmental issue, there are, you know, uh, backlash from the public. Talk about competition can come back from left field and companies are not ready for it. I mean, who would have thunk in Nokia when they had 67% of the world of the uh, world telephones that uh, a computer company, only by the way, 11 years ago was the first iPhone came out. It seems like it was there since cavemen. It was not. It's just from 11 years ago. A computer company will come, and within five years, a Nokia market share will come from 67% to 3%. And many examples like this, you know, the economy, when the economy goes south, all companies are affected. There's a social discontent when people try to, uh, to convince companies not to sell fatty stuff or not to sell sugar, whatever, or not to use the uh, GMO. And of course, there are intentional disruptions whether it's terrorist attack or strikes or anything like this. There's some smart adversary on the other side. And the, it's not so, so, in some sense, it's not so much important why something happened, but what can actually happen. It can be inability to acquire supply regardless of the reason. It can be inability to ship. It can be inability to communicate. It can be inability to convert, to make stuff, to manufacture stuff. It can be loss of personnel. It can be unavailable credit like we had in uh, uh, 2008. And brand and trust diminution. We all remember the Volkswagen case. So there are two ways to look at disruption. That's the standard way to look at it. And you think about the causes, you think about hurricane strike, whatever, you think about effects, as I said. Now, causes help you think, help you estimate what happens, what is the likelihood of a disruption. Effects help you estimate the impact or, and the consequences. If it happens, how bad it's going to be. So people use two-dimensional uh, two uh, uh, classification, which in a minute we'll show can, we can do better. But it's basically something like, Probability and consequences, a map of probability and consequences, and in order to prioritize what we should get ready for, they put all kind, by judgment, put all kind of events on it. So the question is, which quadrant do you think we should focus on? So usually people do like heat map, and you think that the events that have high probability and severe consequences, this is what you should focus on. And my point is not always. You, can sh you really should focus on the event that are severe consequences and don't happen a lot. These are the Katerina. This is the Bhopal. This is Exxon Valdez. These are the things that did not happen to you or your competitors, and you are not prepared for them. You didn't drill for them. You didn't even think about what to do about them. So yes, you should get ready for the, for the uh, events that uh, have high probability and high consequences, but you can drill for them, you can prepare plans. Cisco has a, what they call playbook with 18 plans for 18 types of family of uh, stuff that can happen. However, when we talk about severe consequences and low probability, these are things that did not happen, you did not anticipate, then you have to think about scenarios, to dream scenario, and generally prepare for what we call general resilience. Whatever happens, you should get ready for it. Um, as I said, the standard way to, uh, to prioritize is to do the two-dimensional um, map. I'm adding another dimension, detectability. How long does it take from the time that you think, time that you know something's going to happen until it hits you? What is the time to prepare? This, however, is interesting because not only it's another dimension, but it has a negative side. Something can happen and you didn't even know that it happened. Happens all the time. Somebody stole all the credit card in your system. Somebody just stole all your plans for some, 
for the next product. So we talk about the detectability axis. It goes from negative to long term. So the things that you can find only after the fact, where there's some pathogen in the population, whether it's uh, industrial espionage, some cyber agent, you can think about things that are immediate. Uh, several examples here, but tsunami sensors all along the, uh, the Pacific coast can give you, for example, the Mexico City subway was shut down. They have exactly 40 second uh, alert that uh, a tsunami just hit the coast. And they were able to shut down the subway system. Uh, you can think about short term, is the weather, you're thinking about two, two, three days ahead. You can think about medium term, deteriorating labor relationships, some, some competition come up, governments start, start talking about some regulations, and you can think about long term. Long term are things like aging, uh, population aging, global warming, deteriorating infrastructure, and many others. And here, there's a difference, of course. If we have very short time, the danger increases, but on the other side, when we identify long-term trend, it's an opportunity. And right now, many uh, transportation companies, for example, understand that they are serving a lot of older people, are starting to develop what's called white glove service. They'll deliver your printer and also set it up and show you how to do it and replace the cartridges all the time. So there's a much more in, uh, into the service because they look at it as an opportunity for more business. Let me kind of finish it or go with a case study. The case study is General Motors during the Japan disaster, because this will highlight many of the issues that I'm talking about. And by the way, you have to realize I'm, I'm trying to summarize about 12 years of research and two fat books in about 18 minutes. <laughs> so what happened? This is Japan. This is the epicenter of the earthquake and the tsunami. And these are all the suppliers that were in the danger zone, that were hit, basically, that were out, out of business. No GM facility was out of business. Only suppliers and their suppliers and their suppliers. These are the people who supply parts to GM were out of business. Initial estimate, by the way, it hit on March 11. Nobody at GM got too excited. None of GM facilities were closed. They, were, you know, they didn't even know what ha what's happening in Japan. But three days later, they found out that uh, 30 suppliers, these are the suppliers I show you in the, in the picture, were down. 390 parts affected. Now a car has 50,000 parts, 390 parts. But then some analysts sat and looked, eh, we, cars have to have all the parts. <laughs> we, cannot do, we cannot have cars with some parts and not others. So they say, you know what? We'll have a first production. The first GM plant is going to stop production on March 22nd, in about a week, eight days. And then they also said, you know what? On March 31, we will not be able to make cars. All the production plant of GM will be shut down. Well, at this point, panic <laughs> raged throughout GM. That's a, it's not a small thing, because you have to realize for any manufacturing plant, when it just sits there, the costs keep accumulating. You just don't make cars. But you have to pay for the people, you have to pay for the equipment, you have to pay for the plant. You just don't get any revenue. Not a good thing to have. And by the way, this plant spit out a car about every 45 seconds. So you, when a plant is down, you measure the disaster in minutes, the economic disaster. So GM stood up immediately an emergency operations center. And this is Bob Hurl, who ran the emergency operations center, since then retired from, uh, from GM. That actually, you see one room, there are actually three rooms, two on, uh, on each side of this. There were similar smaller rooms, one in Europe, one in Asia, and they were actually working around the clock. This is the timeline of the key events of, of what happened by date. So March 11, and you can focus on the number of parts. So on March 14, we thought there are only 390 parts. And as we move forward, many things are happening, but watch the number of parts that are missing. It's 1,000 parts, then almost 2,000. By the time we are almost done, now only 6,000 parts that are missing. Now a question for you non-supply chain professionals. Why it took so long and why the number kept growing? Not everybody at once, please. OK. So I'll tell you the answer. The answer is because in modern manufacturing, 
there's a big, what's a deep, what's called bill of material. So a company buys from a company who buys some part from a company who buys some part from a company. It may go 15 companies down. The company at the end out there that you know mines something from from the earth doesn't even know that it serves GM. GM doesn't know who they are. GM knows who the what's called first tier. Who are the people to whom it says it says to send a check? The first tier supplier. But those suppliers have suppliers and those suppliers have suppliers. You're talking about a huge network, which is opaque. You don't even know what it is. So it takes time until people start realizing that they don't have parts and the information starts coming in. This is how they manage it. This is GM uh, part. You see on the left hand side, you see plants. These are code names for the type of cars that are being built there. Then on the top, you see a timeline. And there they have parts that are either X is missing part we cannot build anymore. If it's a, a triangle, means a part is missing, we're working on it, we think we have a solution. Circle means we have a solution, we're going to work at it. This is a few days later, towards the end of March. They were working from both sides of this chart. That's why it was, it was called the white space chart. The white space in the middle is the time when the plants don't make anything. So from the right, they use existing inventory or inventory defined from existing suppliers. The logistics people are working basically working, it's from your left, I guess. From the other side, it's the engineering people who are trying to qualify new parts. You cannot just say, I'm not going to buy it from you, I'm going to buy it from you. This is very regulated industry. Every manufacturing is regulated. And you have to have a lot of testing and a lot of quality tests in order to put a part in the car. So engineering was trying to find similar parts and uh, all over the world and put them in a car. And so that's where we got situation where you have, you can manufacture, then you have some white space. Then at one point, you know that you'll get a replacement part and you work to close this space. This is what it looked like on uh, the end of May. The black stuff, by the way, is plants that were scheduled to sh for, uh, for shutdown. You see in the middle there, um, this black stuff from almost all the plants in the middle is the uh, model change in the summer. GM closes all plants for two weeks to change the model from, uh, from year to year. So some of the lessons, what do you do when you don't have enough supply? So GM may not have enough parts. So the question is, there's an example. I was there right there when it happened. We didn't have enough engine controller, airflow sensor, didn't have parts for trucks, basically. Um, so in general, before we talk about this particular example, there are several ways that you can decide how to allocate. And this comes back to Sherry's issue of how you prioritize, how you allocate. You don't have enough. In this case, it's more of an economic issue than a life-changing issue, even though it may be life-changing for the CEO of GM. You can auction. You can conduct an auction. And during the floods in Thailand, Western Digital conducted auction. Western Digital was hit, and Seagate conducted auction, uh, auctions for disk drives. Now, auctions, every economist worth his soul will tell you it's absolutely the right way to go because you give the part to whoever wants it the most. People don't like it. It looks like profiteering. But, uh, they, but that's what they did. You can dilute stuff. Some brandy manufacturer did not have enough, so they diluted the stuff and got hammered on, uh, on social media stuff doing it. But actually, Intel diluted some of the chemicals during the Japan disaster that they, uh, that they needed and kept making, uh, making chips. Uh, and then there's the triage, which we talk about. In GM example, the triage can be made by financial contribution. For example, this is a truck that was made in a plant in Louisiana. It's a small truck. And GM makes a lot of money on the big truck, loses a lot of money on the small trucks. So guess if they don't have, if, if, uh, if the parts can go to both the small and the big trucks, where does the stuff go? It goes to the big trucks, because they make a lot of money. Also, the, there was field stock, the, the dealers had a lot of the small trucks because nobody wanted to buy them. And that's why the price was so low. So that's how the, they actually closed the plant. They closed the Shreveport plant for one week. The Wall Street Journal wrote article that the end of the world is coming not realizing that it was totally a controlled decision. 
it was a lot of debate that decide to, uh, uh, to close that particular plant for, the, for this set of customers, for this, uh, for this product line. The other lesson, and I will come to the end here, is what GM called swim your lane. Bill Belichick, anybody here knows who Bill Belichick is? Okay, I'm from Boston. So Bill Belichick said, do your job. That's a basic idea here, do your job. So in this case, we have no seat heating modules. So as the engineers and the logistics people are working to find more heat seating modules or to qualify new ones, some VP came, came to, the, to the room and said, build vehicle without heat seating module, just build it without it. Keep building vehicles. Now, the problems with this are that heated seats go with leather. So you build more cloth uh, seats, but cloth and leather affect the mix, the mix of basic and luxury car. Also, canceling the leather seat means that all the assembly and component that went into the seat became stranded in the supply chain somewhere. And any of you ever uh, seen a warehouse know that if too much stuff goes to the warehouse, it stops working. You cannot run a warehouse, you cannot run a distribution center when it's flooded with product. So, and on, on top of it, of course, customers want, want what they want. They don't care that the uh, GM has a problem. The dealers want what they want, the customers what they want. If you want more, these are the two books. Let me stop here and thank you very much. Best process is to have always two teams, the business. One worries about the people, one worries about the business. Those two should never be confused. You have to worry about the continuity of pay, you have to worry about medical help, you have to worry about your employees because this is, this is your best asset. Then you have to worry about getting, uh, getting the business uh, up and working. And in this case, really interesting what Sherry said that you need the change change the culture, we work with a lot of businesses about changing the culture because the idea is to let the lowest level in the organization respond without getting all the approvals. This happens in organizations that are trained for it. If you're in the Marines and somebody is shooting you, so you shoot back, you don't ask, you don't get you know, permission from uh, up to Mattis. Uh, if you are on an aircraft carrier, it's actually true, there's a problem. Any, law, any sale on an aircraft carrier can stop the operation, whether they are 19 year old uh, with a, you know, one year of training, can stop the operation of 15 ships with 17 sailors and marines. They don't have time to get all the permissions up and down. So they, businesses first need to get this culture. Who sits in the operation center? The operation center has several hundred people when something, the, the emergency operation center, when something like this happens. Who sits there? You don't have people who are, you know, that's their job. It's people who have experience with prior projects, prior disasters. And they have the depth and the breadth of knowledge and can work, by the way, 20 hours every day and sleep only four. Um, so once you identify these people, these are the people that, uh, that you work with. I mentioned Walmart. Walmart has a very sophisticated emergency operations center, also with hundreds of people in case of a big hurricane. They know what they're doing. But to me, the main thing that the, the public should do, this again, on something, just get out of the way. They know what people, because they have experience around the country in every disaster. They know that people need Pop-Tarts. Pop they send a lot of Pop-Tarts. People like eating Pop-Tarts. So they send a lot of pop in addition to water and stuff like this, of course. But they, they, know, they know which the store, they're con connected to all the stores. They know which store is open, which store is not. The trick to me, in terms of FEMA, for example, FEMA also has a lot of equipment, a lot of what's needed, not to overlap. To use stuff that the private sector cannot supply or doesn't have the capability to supply and to work together. One of the things PNG was so successful uh, uh, during Katerina because they had good relationship with the local police who can get the truck to move to the plant. They opened the plant 17 days after Katerina. President Bush was there, it was a big deal because they had the 
Folger plant, which makes half the coffee in the United States, right there, um, because they had police escort, because they knew the police chief. I mean, it's just the communication. As I, I, in my books, I say, when something happened to your plant, your plant is under fire, it's not a good time to call 911 and start identifying who you are, or call the police chief and start, yeah, I'm this. There's no time for this. You should know the person. So having prior relationship between, you know, all elements of public sector and all elements of, uh, of private sector is crucial. And as many of the speakers talk about it, collaboration, communication, it's key to effective resilience and effective response. One of the important things that not always happen, but should happen, happens in the good company, is to keep the CEO and senior management out of the decision process. <laughs> CEO did not get to be decision maker. They did not get to be where they are because they are wallflowers. They're type A people and they like to take action. In modern companies, there is no one man who has the knowledge to take the right action. It is too complex. I just talk about a network of, talk about Flex, it's a company, uh, custom manufacturing company. I know the number of Flex because I just work with them. They have 14,000 first tier suppliers. They have about 300,000 second tier suppliers. They have no idea how many suppliers they actually have. They have millions. I, just understanding how the stuff flow and who does what, no one person can know. That's why you need to have teams. You need to have team with experience. It's mostly, in most companies, it's, uh, in, in manufacturing company, it's engineering and logistics. In uh, companies like Walmart, it's basically uh, merchandising. Uh, the people who get the stuff to this, so merchandising and logistics. Um, as I mentioned, they have the communication line set up in advance. If you sit, uh, companies like Walgreen, Rite Aid, Walmart, uh, Target have know everything that happens in every store all the time. That's not the emergency operation, that's regular operation. They know if a refrigerator in a store goes above a certain temperature. They know it in headquarters. Because everything has, in, today with the internet of things and sensors, everything is wired. So they know that part. They have information about each refrigerator in each store in Walmart or you know, Kroger, if the meat is still good or not. This information should flow to the local emergency management, to the public uh, sector who, uh, uh, who runs all this. Next to this, in Walmart, for example, is the emergency operations center. That's what you, because then you have to marshal resources. You have to send you know, hundreds of trucks and get the permission and get the stuff and get them loaded and it's which distribution center. You make sure that you don't, um, take away from other parts of the country that, you, you know, so they have a system of distribution centers, support distribution centers, support, uh, support, it's a whole thing. Well thought out in advance. So they have procedures that are thought out in advance to do all the things. They know who to call, who to sit in the center, all the communication. They know everybody who works in every store, all the people, BP, for example, got, you know, had their own problem, but BP has actually a good system of not only knowing who is in the platform of the, uh, of the Gulf of Mexico, they know where they live, who all their families are, and who is depending on the people on the, plat on the platform. Because if there's some problem on the platform, they want to make sure that the workers stay on the platform. So if you need to, uh, to worry about wife and kids and uh, uh, elderly parents and who on whatever, they'll take care of it. They have a team that on the ground will take care of it so you can stay there. Think about all the information this requires. They have tens of thousands of workers. Each one of them is totally in the system. So having this ahead of time, of course, helps. And companies, let me just finish, I'm running out of time. Um, I wrote the first book after 9-1-1. Um, 9-1-1, I was in a, England, and they ask us what will happen if the next Al-Qaeda attack is not going to be on some government target, but on something they really care about, like you know, a refinery or some port or some economic target. People look, look at each other. Nobody had an answer. 
So actually, the British government funded my first book, which came out a week after Katerina. Good timing for, uh, for a book like this. Ten years later, I was talking to the same companies that I interviewed before and told me, you need to write another book because the dangers have increased, but the capabilities have increased as well. So I talk in the next book about a lot of the new capabilities that exist in the 2015, uh, this book came out. Uh, 